Thanks. Um, I wanted to bring back your point of um, the idea of the myth of trying to make people who are artistic more, more the same as everyone else. And I just wanted to, if, wondered if you could speak about kind of this balance between how do we keep our kids with these high expectations and help them to be their best selves and successful, yeah. but also changing the view of the world and having more acceptance in regards to our tolerance for people who are different. Right. Well, the, Shannon Rosa was actually a huge inspiration to me while I was writing the book because she, um, you know, she takes Leo places, you know, and sometimes Leo, you know, uh, has an issue or whatever, but it, Shannon, like, knows how to both be in the world out and proud, if you will, you know, with her son, um, and she also knows, like, well, she sits near the back of movie theaters so they can leave quickly if, you know, and um, I think that just I mean, this is not um, very practical advice for like creating an IEP or something, but it's like, I think that the more that parents are willing to take their kids to public places and the more that autistic people are willing to, you know, not uh, hide their, you know, if they want to rock and stim, like, go for it, you know. I think that the more we recognize that autistic people are here and are part of our culture and are making valuable contributions and it's another kind of humanity that it'll be better for... I mean, it's amazing to me what a better world for autistic people kids who are di being diagnosed now are going to grow up into, I think. Um, and especially if the neurodiversity idea takes hold. And there's, you know, one of the... Neurodiversity is still a relatively new concept, and it's still in play, in a sense. And so new, in fact, that my British publisher would not use the American subtitle. Uh, the, Amer the subtitle in Britain is The Legacy of Autism and How to Think Smarter About People Who Think Differently, which is so many words. It's like, <laughs> my God, it's as long as the book. So um, uh, I think that what we need to do is to define neurodiversity as, for instance, including concepts of the social model of disability. Um, that it's not about, like, autism, it's fun, you know? <laughs> that, that, it's, that it's actually about really serious, you know, welcoming disabled people into the community by making changes in society that accommodate their needs. Um, and that has been a thread in the neurodiversity community from the very beginning. Like, uh, at, the, at the first, the autistic retreat I went to was called Autreat. At the first Autreat, they had a seminar on deaf culture. And so they were already trying to build bridges with other disabled communities. And th there's a guy named Ari Niemann of the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network who noticed that it's kind of weird, like autism is never considered in a disability context. It's always in a medical or clinical context. And why isn't it thought of as another form of disability? Which it obviously is. And you know, some people say, like even some BBC guys said to me like, so you're claiming that autism is not a disability. No, I'm claiming it is a disability. It's not a plague or an epidemic, but it's a disability. So society knows how to make accommodations for disability. So let's start doing that. You know, instead of sending another $50 million to the Beijing Genomics Institute to find another 50 candidate genes for autism. And I'm not saying all that's worthless research because we may find molecular pathways that would help us, uh, for instance, relieve epilepsy. For, you know, that's a really serious problem for a lot of people on the spectrum. The question that I have um, is because I'm um, coming from Vienna myself. It's a little bit historical. And my question would be, uh, do you know, uh, have you uh, addressed a little bit, or is there something to address at all, a uh, relationship between Asperger and Sigmund Freud? Oh. Was he familiar, yeah. f f familiar with his work? And the question also that um, goes down is, um, was Asperger researching into the causes, what, cause, what, what was causing autism? And was he applying mainly neurological methods or also psychoanalytical or whatever, but what was you know, the state of the art at this point? Well, one thing that I do know is that the American psychiatrist who visited Asperger's clinic 
was surprised to see that the the work there was not informed by the work of Sigmund Freud. Um, one interesting thing about Sigmund Freud is that because in America, the, the idea of the refrigerator mother, which Leo Connor applied to autism in a sense, um, which became so popular, people think that came from Freud. It did not. Freud you know, was a neurologist originally or uh, had a neurological training. And he believed that schizophrenia was caused by something in biology. And, and Asperger believed that, he very presciently believed, that autism was caused not only by something in the genes, but by the interaction of multiple genes. He used the word polygenetic. And that's something we have only figured out, you know, mainstream science in America in the last 20 years or so. So... And Simon Cohen, Cohen explicitly said, I guess, in one article, that it's like the typical, the most a typical male brain because it's so much technical. Because the people, uh, I think it's quite like working towards a stereotype, because people um, tend to want to be so much, you know, um, excess as a so very good in, in the technical fields. Do you think this is a stereotype, or he's working towards a stereotype, or is there something to it? Um, well, I was very, um, I wasn't very satisfied. He stole that idea from Asperger, actually. Um, but here's the thing: um, Simon Baron Cohen, uh, his ideas often don't translate well uh, in his popular books. I would say, like he's widely, you know, disliked. Uh, among autistic self-advocates that I know of because of his, um, his comments about empathy. Um, I've met him a lot, and I've talked to him about his profoundly disabled uh, sister, who he loves very much and who was institutionalized for most of her life. And I know that he's a good guy, but uh, I also know that he said a lot of things that have had a, had a terrible effect uh, on the autism community. And saying that he's saying the extreme male brain in a stereotypically male way, it's an oversimplification of what he's actually saying. But, like, he doesn't mean gender, like, he means something that transcends gender. But it's, like, really complicated and nuanced and doesn't come across very well. And so I understand why people would say, oh, fuck that, you know? <laughs> but... Uh, but I also understand what he says when he says, well, it's actually more complicated. You know, so, yeah. I mean, one thing that's definitely true is that, um, that I find very interesting is that many young autistic people that I know do not identify as binary gendered, you know, or binary heterosexual, homosexual. Many of them identify as asexual, bisexual, non-binary gender, polyamorous, no, a, you know, aromantic. Like somebody sent to me like a like a list of 150 terms that autistic young autistic people had, had sent her as descriptions of their own emotional sexual lives, and boy, you know, it was it was very uh, you know complex and non-binary. And I think that's really interesting. 